Hey, Cedar Ridge, it's good to be with you. Welcome back to our series we've called The Story. Welcome our Sepulpa campus, our Coeta campus, our online viewers. We're glad to have you along with us on this series. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. We'll be looking at chapter 1 and chapter 2, although this particular chapter of the story included many of the, uh, the first few chapters of the book of Acts. We're going to kind of target uh, just those first two and look at some key passages there uh, as we go along. We've been in this series, The story now since the beginning of the year, and we have covered the Old Testament, and we looked at uh, story after story that was pointing its way to what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. Jesus, the Son of God, being flesh, living here on this earth, and we watched as we saw prophecy talking about him, pointing to him, uh, stories uh, foreshadowing him, talking about the king who was going to come. We talked about uh, uh, stories that revealed him as a redeemer that was going to come, a deliverer, a true deliverer that was going to come. And so we have been leading up to the Son of God being put here on this earth and walking and living and breathing and then suddenly he dies. And then of all surprises, last week we talked about his resurrection. And then the book of Acts picks up for us the story from there on out. In fact, it's Luke who writes that as kind of a sequel to the gospel of Luke. And so he goes right into the book of Acts and gives us a clear direction of what's taking place. And so when we open up Acts chapter 1, Jesus has died and he is already risen and he begins to make appearances. In fact, I just want to look at verse 3 of chapter 1 where it says, after his suffering, after Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to them. Who, who's the them? Well, it's his disciples, his, immediately follow, his immediate followers. And he gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So Jesus, in his resurrected state, is with his disciples, with his followers, and he's talking to them about the kingdom, and he's comforting them, and he's telling them more about the kingdom that's going to become. For 40 days, that's the case. And then we understand that Jesus uh, is going to tell them, I'm, I'm going to go back to heaven. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to ascend into heaven and I'm going to give you a comforter. And so the disciples are wondering, what's going to happen now? Wait a minute, Jesus, we have been following you. What do we do now? What's the plan from here on out? And what we come to understand that God's plan is his church. God's plan at this point in time is his church. And, and the book of Acts is what, where we find what the church is to be like. In fact, Jesus leaves some parting words just a few verses later about what his followers are to do. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, just to the church. This is what you're supposed to be. This is the plan. I want you to notice, first off, he says, you're going to be my witnesses. That's a, that's a key, a key word right there. See, when I grew up... We talked in church about going witnessing or doing witnessing. We were going to go witness to people. It meant basically that we shared our faith. We gave the plan of salvation. We were going to witness. But I want you to notice right here, the language that Jesus gives is that you are to be witnesses. Not to do it, but you are to be witnesses. It means that we're to be 24-7 Witnesses of what God has done in our lives. It's who we are, not something we, that we do. We reflect the values of God's perfect community. In fact, that, has, that is what we have seen throughout the story. Story after story after story. What God is wanting is that we would reflect who He is. That we would be to the world a reflection of God's values. That the world would be able to see God through his people. And here, here Jesus is saying, you will be my witnesses and you'll do that throughout the world. We keep seeing that again and again written throughout the story. What God wants of his people is that they would be a true reflection of what, what God is really like. That people would be able to see God through us. And we all recognize it's hard to do. This is not an easy thing that Jesus is asking of his people. Be my, be my witnesses. Be a representation of God, of me, to the people that you come into contact with. 
Unfortunately, Jesus doesn't expect us to do it alone. See, as he ascended into heaven, he also says, I'm going to send someone to be with you. I'm going to give you power through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And so this Holy Spirit, this, this part of the Trinity, comes down into our lower story and, and empowers us to live lives where we can accomplish the mission. I mean, the Holy Spirit is going to empower us. It's going to give courage to us. It's going to give guidance to us. We live changed lives because of, the, because of the Holy Spirit as we come into a relationship with God and it draws people to Jesus. And Jesus says, you're going to start doing that right where you are. They were in Jerusalem as he was talking. And you're going to spread it out in the regions around you. And I want you to make sure that it happens to the ends of the world. I want you to go to every place. I want everyone to hear. I want you to go uh, to everyone on the planet and make sure that they hear about me. See, God has always had a heart for the nations. God, from the very beginning, had planned for his people to bless the nations and to be a reflection, to be his witnesses, to be his representation to, to the people around him. That's, that's the purpose of his blessing of, of the people in the Old Testament, the Israelites. His purpose was to bless them so they would be a blessing to others. His people reflecting his values to the world around them. And so that's the purpose of the, the church. That's what God designed. So God's telling his people, you, Jesus telling his people, you wait, you wait right here in Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit is about to come. We get to Acts chapter 2 and that's exactly what takes place. Acts chapter 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, let's stop right there for just a minute because we talked about how Jesus was with his disciples up to 40 days after he died and, and, res, and rose again. And so we've got this 40-day window right there of Jesus making appearances to his apostles and to people that were followers of him, uh, to, one time to a crowd of 500 people. Uh, and so that's taking place. We know Jesus died around the Passover. Well, 50 days after the Passover, there was another special Jewish feast. It was called Pentecost, a special festival. And so this is 50 days after. So Jesus has already ascended to heaven, there's been about a 10-day window where it's been quiet and they've been holed up and they've been scared and they don't know what to do and they're waiting just like Jesus had told them. But when the waiting was over, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Let's talk about that word tongues for just a minute because it is specifically the word for languages. They began to speak in languages that other people could understand as the Spirit enabled them to do that. Why did they need to speak in other known languages at the time? Well, it's because they were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when people would have been coming from all around the known world to be in the, 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 the place, the, the city of God for this special time. Some of them had stayed since since the Passover feast. Some of them had stayed for that, that entire time frame, and they're still there. And there are people from all known nationalities. There are people from all languages, people that cannot speak the common Greek language that was known at the time. They can't speak uh, uh, Arabic. They can't uh, uh, speak uh, Hebrew. And so the Holy Spirit enables the disciples to start speaking in these languages that they never understood. And it draws a crowd. It draws a commotion. And, and God uses the opportunity to tell them that there is something new that's taking place. That there is this new beginning that, it, that God is doing something brand new. And Peter preaches a sermon. You can read it all through through Acts chapter 2, but something phenomenal happens at the end of Acts chapter 2, and that is that the church starts. In fact, I want to skip all the way down to chapter 2, verse 42, and we've got this, this new community, this new church that started, and it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to these things. It means they, they, they weren't just casually connected, but they were deeply committed, devoted. They were deeply committed to these four things. And if we want to be people of the book, if we want to be 
people who do what God tells us to do, we ought to pay attention to these four things. Number one is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. For us, that's just biblical teaching. They devoted themselves to God's word, not just listening to inspirational stories and not just hearing good, upbeat, uplifting kinds of things, but they were committed to God's word. They said, this is what guides us. This is what directs us. This is, this is the compass by which we follow this teaching from God's word. And that ought to be the case for us. That we are, are so in tune, that we are so devoted to God's word, that we will follow it no matter what it says. We'll stand on the word of God. It may not be popular. It may not be the politically correct thing. It may not be the thing that makes us feel good. It may be opposed to everything around us, but we will stand on the word of God. They were devoted to the, the apostles' teaching. And when we're devoted to God's word, we... We, we do what it tells us to do in regard to how we work and how we relate to people. We, it, it, it changes the way that we do marriage. It changes the way that we engage in our relationships. That's the kind of devotion that the early church had. In fact, after the first sermon, after Peter preaches in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, it says that the people were cut to the heart and they said, what should we do? In fact, that, that sermon and that response teaches us that God's word requires a response from us. It requires that we make some kind of, of response to it. What do we do? In fact, that's the way that we ought to walk out of every service where God's word is proclaimed is what do we need to change? What do we need to do differently? How do I need to respond with that? That ought to be the way that we leave any class. That ought to be the way that we walk away from our personal Bible study is, what, God, are you doing inside of me through your word that's going to change me in some way? What am I going to do differently? When we're devoted to, to godly biblical teaching like that, it requires a response from us. And so they were devoted to that. They were also devoted to fellowship. It's the relational part of things. You see, this early church recognized that they were a community of believers that had to depend upon one another. And the only thing that many of them had in common, they were different. They were, there were rich people and there were poor people and there were slaves and there were rulers. There were people all over the, the, the social map. But the one thing that they had in common was Jesus, and they clung to that. In fact, we'll talk a little bit more about how those relationships were lived out. They were devoted to, to fellowship. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. It, in this context, it's talking about communion. It was something that they did regularly. In fact, it's something that we do every week. And the importance of it for that early church was when they got together, and most often they would do that on a Sunday night because they worked all day Sunday, but they recognized the first day of the week as the Lord's day, as the, the day that Jesus arose. And they, they got together and they celebrated that night after everybody got off work and they had a big potluck meal as everybody contributed to that. And at the end of that meal, they would have this love feast where somebody would stand up and just like Jesus, they would break bread and pass it around and they had this communion service where they remembered regularly the sacrifice that Jesus had made for them and that's why we do it every every week that's why we do it every Sunday when we come together is to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made just like the early church and they were devoted to prayer in fact, as you read through those first few chapters of the book of Acts, you see time after time after time God's people turning to him in prayer. When they were in great need, when they were in great trouble, when they didn't know what to do next, they prayed. I'm excited about how our church is making that more of a priority. And we've got a team of people right now that are, that are working on leading our church into being a people, a community of prayer. In fact, I'm excited about uh, in September, we're going to have a season of prayer where we're praying for unreached people around the world. We're going to ask you to be a part of something special where you come and devote some time to praying for us to have a heart like God, for the nations and God to move and God to work around this world. They were devoted 
to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And something phenomenal takes place. In fact, the next few verses tell us that everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. It doesn't mean that they did everything alike, that they were all alike. It's just that they had Jesus in common and it created this unity within them. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. It was something they did regularly. They needed each other. And they broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God was up to something. And it was exciting to watch this early church as, as, as everyone knew something is happening, something new is happening. God is up to something and the Holy Spirit has come down and, and is making something happen. And it, it transforms people. They gave to each other as they had need. Not as people gave it back. Not because they got something in return. They just paid it forward. In fact, they paid it forward long before it was a cool thing to do. That was just what the early Christians did. They just took care of one another. And because they were so different, they were compelling. They were an influence on society. They were full of joy for what Jesus had done for them. And when other people saw it, they wanted to be a part of it. And I suspect a lot of it had to do with this. When they were together, they were together with glad and sincere hearts. You know, unfortunately for people today, when they look at Christians, they don't think of us as full of joy and authenticity. They often think of us more of being judgmental and hypocritical. The exact opposite of that. Instead of glad and sincere hearts, instead of joyful and authentic and sincere, they see people who are mad and judgmental and inauthentic. You know, we could change a lot about our culture if the church just decided we were going to be happy, real people. If the church just said, you know what, if, if, if we can't do anything else, we're, we're at least going to do those things that the early church, we're going to be people that are going to be known for being joyful and real sincere. That's the way the early church was, and it was compelling to people. It was influential to people. People wanted to be a part of what they were doing. That's the picture of the early church. That's the picture that, that God leaves us and says, this is, this is your mission. This is what, what I want you to do. Unfortunately, we have sometimes a much different picture of what the church is like, of what it's supposed to be like. Often we think of the church in other terms. And I'm going to throw some pictures up on the screen that maybe communicate a little bit about how, how sometimes in our culture we perceive the church Sometimes for us, the church is more like a movie theater. You know what you do to a movie theater. It's a place that you go. It's a place that most often you go on the weekend, and you go to be entertained, don't you? You go to at least be distracted for a while. You go to see a good movie. You go to just to kind of get away. You go for some entertainment factor. And you go hoping you're going to find a comfortable seat and something good to eat while you're there. And when the movie's over, what's the first thing that you do? Well, everybody, as they're walking out, begins to go into this critique mode about how the movie was, how good it was. Was it a good movie? Uh, you know, where, what did you think about the actors? What did you like about it? Was it a two thumbs up movie? What, how many stars would you give it? And we go into critique mode about that. And if we're not careful, we can, we can kind of turn that into a function after we go to a church service. We begin to go into critique Mode. We began to, to, to think, was it, was it good? Was it too long? Was it, was, it, was it stuff that we liked? Did we like the music? Did we like the way things went? And we can begin, if we're not careful, to think of ourselves as the audience. And let's be clear, there is an audience when we come together for church worship. But it's not us. The audience is God. 
He is the only audience here. We're not here to be entertained. We don't come together so that we can get the things that we like and decide whether it's good or bad. In fact, I want you to listen to this quote by A.W. Tozer. Our churches these days are filled with a soft breed of Christians that must be fed on a, on a diet of harmless fun to keep them interested. See, we, we live in a culture that just is accustomed to being entertained. We, our lives revolve around entertainment. You're probably, after you watch this later, you're going to go home and you're going to flip on a TV, a DVR, a DVD. You're going to put something in that's going to entertain you for a little bit longer. Maybe you're going to go out to, to eat and you're going to be entertained for a while. And we're not careful. We, we turn church into something like that. We come to church and we just expect it to be entertained. We like to be challenged at church, but we don't like to change. We want to be fed, but we don't want to spend any time in the kitchen. We want the church to be united, but we want everybody to unite around us and the things that we like. If we're not careful the church for us can be like a like a movie theater or the church it can be kind of like a shopping center a big mall a big conglomerate of stores a shopping place where we go to find things that we like and things that we want to pick out the things that are good for us and so we find ourselves throughout the week ultimately walking through a store somewhere where we're looking for things to buy and we're looking for we're looking for things that we like and we're looking for the right price. And if the right price isn't there, or if they don't have the things that we like, we'll just go to another store. There's another one down the street. We can find another store that we'll go to. Go to. And even that, that language of shopping becomes a part of our churches, doesn't it? I talk with guests who come to our church all the time, and I'm visiting with them afterwards, and we're just talking about uh, you know, what, 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 what it is that caused them to be here that day, and oftentimes they'll tell me, just honestly, we're church shopping. We're church shopping. Now, I know what they mean by that. It may not be as bad as it sounds. I hope it's not as bad as it sounds often, but they'll... Just be right up front. We're looking to see what your church has to offer. To see if what you have is a fit for our preferences and what we like. And I get some of that to a point, but we have in our consumer society gone way beyond what's appropriate there. If we're not careful, we can be about what's about me. And we can... We can just continue shopping and hoping for our preferences to turn the church into just a shopping center. The early church weren't customers. They weren't people looking for a deal, looking for a price, looking for what fitted them, fit them. They, they were family. They were thrust together because of a culture that wasn't favorable to Christianity, and they had to cling to one another. They didn't fight one another for the best price. They were drawn to one another because they needed one another. They became brothers and sisters. In fact, that's what they called one another, brothers and sisters, because of the family in Christ. The truth is that there are some of you that have been shopping for a long, long time. You've been church shopping for a long time. And it's time for you to step over the line. It's time for you to quit thinking about whether this is going to be the best fit or the best place or if it's going to fit all your likes and your wants. And you just need to commit to the family and say, we're going to be more about what we can give than what we can get. And some of you need to just decide, I'm going to become a member of the church. We're going to, we're going to just cross that line. We're just going to do it. You've been coming for months. You've been coming maybe for years. And you, you just have kind of been waiting and holding off. And I know what some of you, the problem is you just don't like that word member. And you, quite honestly, I don't like the word member either because it makes me think of like a country club member. But that's not what we're talking about. When we talk about becoming a member of our church, we're talking more about being a family member. 
becoming brothers and sisters in Christ who need one another to be able to do the mission that God has given us. There's another picture that maybe describes that. It's the picture of a, of a restaurant. We all go out to eat at some point in time, and we all have the same expectation of a restaurant. Uh, we're, we're, we're planning to go to a restaurant, and it's there that we're going to be waited on. We're going to be served at a restaurant, especially that's that nice. We expect to be served well. It would be unusual for you to walk in a place and have to clean your own table or for somebody to go back and say, I need you to cook your own meal. We would go, that's not the place that we're going to be. And the decision, again, in when we see that in church eyes is, am I going to be a consumer walking into a restaurant expecting to be fed, expecting to be served, or am I going to be a contributor? And the church is nothing like a restaurant. The church is nothing like a restaurant where people wait upon us, waiting to be fed, where we want to consume. In fact, I can tell you right now that spiritual growth most often takes place in the kitchen rather than at the table. It is when you pitch in, it is when you serve, it is when you contribute that you are most likely to grow, not when you're just waiting for somebody else to feed you and to wait on you. And selfless service marked the early church. That's what they were about. They took care of one another. They jumped in and just served one another. They gave up their rights for one another. There's another picture maybe that kind of describes it for us. It's like a gas station. You know, you have to go in there once a week and you swing by and you fuel up. That's, that's what a gas station is. And then you probably don't even think about it again until the fuel gauge gets low or it starts dinging on you and you're like, I need to go back, I need to go back and, and fill up the gas tank. And if we're not careful, we can think about the church that way. We're to, you know, every once in a while go and, 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 and fill up the tank. We need to get biblically fed. We need to have our biblical uh, fix, our spiritual feel, fill. And, you know, after we get that Sunday morning, we head back out. We really don't think about it again until the next Sunday. But you know what? If you, if you read that scripture with me about the early church, that, that was not them. In fact, as we read that, it said daily that they got together. They met together often, every day. Now, church is supposed to be a part of us every day. We are the church. It is an everyday thing for us. It doesn't mean we come to a building. It doesn't mean you come to the place, a, a, a church place, a location. Uh, that, that's not what we're talking about. But, but, but it means that, that, that church is a part of everyday life for you. It's not just a weekend occurrence. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's something that takes place. It's something that I do. It's something that I am all the time. There are some of you who need to take a step with our church in this regard. Because right now, Church is just a Sunday morning thing for you. You come and I hope you get filled up. I hope you get spiritually fed. But I, I hope you see that the church is so much more than a weekly fill up. That it is something because of the relationships and because of the fellowship that takes place that happens more often than that. In fact, we talk about it every week about You've taken another step with us, taken a next step. You've come, you've come to the Sunday morning worship and celebration time. But we need you, we need you to live life with some people. We need you to, to get involved in one of our ridge groups where you're engaged with people and you are doing life with them. You're doing church, you're being church with them. Not just on a Sunday morning, but church is a, a part of everyday life. You're connected, you're engaged, you're immersed in those relationships. The church is not a building or a place you go. It's, it's a people. It's, it's you and I. We are the church, and it has to be more than just Sunday. One last picture of what sometimes our church can be. For some of you, you'll need a little help with that. I hear this is what the inside of a fitness center looks like. I don't get into it very, get into them very often. But you know what a fitness center is for. Sometimes we can think about the church like that. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait a minute. That's probably a pretty good picture. It's for people who need to get in shape. But let's be honest here. We all know that it's not people who need to get into shape that go to gyms. 
It's people who are already in shape. And the reason they go to the gym is to stay in shape. That, that's, just, that's just who goes to a gym. You go look out and you, you recognize that's the people that are, that are here. In fact, some of us just like to you know, think it makes us healthier when we pay a gym membership. We never show up. We just pay it and we hope that'll make us feel a little bit better about our health. And a lot of people think of church the same way. They don't want to go to church because it looks like there everybody's in shape. It looks like there that everybody has it together. They've got their marriage together. They're spiritually in shape. They've got life together. Everything's working out for them. And people say, I'm not going to go to the church because I'm not there. I heard about a gym in Chicago that the only people who can join are people who need to lose at least 50 pounds. If you don't want to lose at least 50 pounds, you can't be a part of this gym. And they explain it this way. They say, other often gyms are their own worst enemies because the very people that need their help the most don't feel comfortable in coming. Hmm. May we not be that way at Cedar Ridge. May we be the kind of place where the people that need it most feel comfortable coming. Because the truth is, you may have walked into the doors of one of our campuses and it may have appeared to you that people have their ducks in a row and they have their lives together. And I want to just be very honest with you, there's not any of us that are in shape spiritually. We're all on a journey. We're all messes. We're all misfits. And we're on a journey together, walking together, where we can, we can hopefully be more like Jesus. And if you're looking around and you think everybody else has it together, they, 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 they don't. None of us have it together. And we're all seeking God and we're all working together. I love that passage we read in verse 47 where it said, The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What it tells me is that outsiders were coming into the church, not the location, but coming into the people, the church, and they were becoming insiders. The Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. That's what the church is to be. We're to be that kind of place where people come, where people are apart, and people feel comfortable. The church is not a movie theater where we get entertained and we're comfortable and we think we're the audience. The church is not a shopping center where we pick out what we want and we look at things that we like. It's not a restaurant where we come in expecting to be waited on and to be served. It's not a gas station where we swing by for a weekly fill up and, and then head back to life. It's not a gym for those that are in shape already. In fact, the church isn't a place at all. The church is a family. And maybe most importantly, the church is where our lives intersect with the upper story. Where, where we recognize that God is doing something. And because he sent Jesus, we experience this forgiveness of sin that, that gives us gives us that eternity with God, what God has always wanted. And because of Jesus sending His Holy Spirit, we're empowered to live transformed lives that then as a church we just reflect out into a world that desperately needs to hear about Jesus. Desperately needs to know Him. And that circle just keeps spreading farther and farther to the ends of the earth. The church is where you and I intersect with the upper story of God fulfilling His mission, doing what He has called us to do to touch the world for Him. Father, thank You so much that You have given us such an incredible responsibility, that You think so highly of Your creation, that You have given us this, this mission of reflecting You to the world around us. And God, forgive us when we have seen the church as something less Forgive us, God, when we have made the church about entertaining us, about serving us. 
Forgive us, God, when we have turned it into something that makes people that need to know you not even comfortable coming. God, we want to restore your church. We want it to be like the beautiful thing that you created, the new beginnings in Acts chapter 2. A church where people are filled with awe. A church that is empowered by your Holy Spirit that does amazing things. And a church that is compelling and influential to the culture around us. God, we know that we cannot do that alone. And we ask you for your help. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.